We'll show you what it's all about, and it'll make your shirt go up and down your back like a Venetian in line. I suppose you could say it's the only thing in the world like it. It's just off the planet. This is something that no one else does. It belongs to Australia, and everyone's involved, and it's exciting. What you see is what you get. For 32 years, one man has led an outback boxing troop that allows ordinary men and women to fight for entertainment. This is tent boxing, and the ring is the people. The people are the ring. Tent boxing is not like professional boxing. Everyone that walks through the doors are part of it. It's like a show, and that's what it's all about. But it's a fair dick and good show. But this is the last remaining tent boxing troupe in the world. It's an Australian icon that's about to be lost forever. Tent boxing is Australian, and I'm proud to run it, and it belongs to everyone in Australia, and when it goes, a part of Australia is going to go. And once it's gone, well, the outback will never be the same. Hello. Tent boxing is a traditional form of travelling show where any takers can fight professional boxers for a cash reward. Today, the sport is banned in America and in England, leaving just one tent boxing troupe remaining. It's in Australia, and it's run by this man. Well, let's face it, it's the only place you can come and have a good time without taking any clothes off, so that's not too bad, is it? Word gets around the bush, and uh, they just come from everywhere. To many, Fred Brophy is more than a boxing showman. He is an outback hero that helps rural communities by employing and mentoring the locals. But with Fred planning to retire, this will be his last tour. And then tent boxing will be a thing of the past. There are six stops on this final Queensland tour and is kicking off in Fred's hometown of Krakow. Home to just 200 people, this sleepy gold mining town will expand this weekend as a thousand visitors flock to experience Fred's unique show. Yeah, I can hear him now coming in. Coming in over here. Fred has 20 or so boxers in his troop who travel to each boxing event. The troop's number one boxer. The cowboy is about to make his entrance. He's coming. He's only here to mentor tonight, but he's promised Fred one final fight in Birdsville in a few months' time. Oh, yeah, cowboy. There you go, boy. Good to see you. Of course we are. Let's go. Oh, I've been with Fred for 16, 17 years. We've had 512 fights in the boxing team. It's been fantastic. Um, probably the best 18 years of my life. It's sat me where I am. Um, it's opened up doors for me. But competition is getting younger and stronger, and this is definitely going to be my last year. With the cowboy set to hang up his gloves. Former Australian Super Cruiserweight champion James Ellis is next in line to become the new number one. As Cowboy retires and you know, someone's got to step up to the mark and everyone seems to be pointing the finger at me and it, it's quite daunting, you know, like there's people just want to go out of their way to fight the Cowboy. He's the number one star. That's the biggest shoes to ever try and fill. Let's go, let's rock and roll. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, Soul Boxing Ten has been in my family for four generations. Uh, this is where 
heavyweight champions are discovered. Anyone who wants to earn himself a reputation, I'll certainly get one here tonight. Throw these boys are in town, the boys from the bush. Give it a rally. that are thinking about earning himself a reputation, I'll tell you what, it takes a man with a lot of the gut and courage to come up here and fight someone that they've never seen fight before, or a woman, it doesn't make any difference, that's what you call a fair dick of Australians and that's what it's all about here tonight. But what we'll do first, we'll find out if there's anyone out there that wants to have a fight, put your hand up in the air, we'll start with the first one, who wants it? This big fella, get up the ladder, have a look at the size of this bloke. Have a look at this bloke, get him, give him a rally. When that challenger gets up in the crowd, my job is to make sure that everyone's matched up evenly. I only get a couple of minutes to talk to you, right? You're not a, you're not a uh, electrician, are you? You know, there's things that you've learned over the years in the trade that you can, you can sense. Now tell me something, uh, have you done any boxing before? Not, not in the ring, just a bit of sparring and that. Oh, just a bit of sparring. Initially they tell you a lot of lies, but you get used to that. What do you do for a living? I'm a hunter. You're a hunter? You're talking to them real up close, and you can see if there's any scars on them. From New Zealand, what do you do for a living? You look like a bouncer. <laughs> it's something that I've had for years, and it just comes into you. It's your instinct. I can read them. Have you done any boxing before? No. Never? What about around the streets and that? No. What about on the football field? No. In other words, you're a liar. <laughs> you got to make sure that they fight the right person. Works out pretty good over the years. I've, I've, I haven't been wrong many times. Just uh, join in the queue, follow the crowd. Don't push in sharp. Fred once toured the whole of Australia the year round. But these days, he only plays to six Queensland towns in winter. At each show, as many as 700 people will pay 25 bucks for 90 minutes of good old-fashioned entertainment. And uh, we'll show you what it's all about, believe you or not. OK, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. It's great to see you all here. OK, now, listen. In my corner here, ladies and gentlemen, James Ellis, get around. Money cruiserweight, and yet Fred calls me his heavyweight, so I fight blokes that are 50 kilos heavier than me. And usually he says, Who's the biggest and best fighter in town? And, and that's the bloke I usually fight. Hurricane from Dubbo in New South Wales, in the rally there. Getting nervous, you have no idea how much that affects me. So I'm undefeated in the tent. I've got to have an unblemished career as a tent boxer, you know, that's quite difficult. Good free round, and over the belt and the kidneys are behind the back and neck. If you box him more than Matt, let him get back on and do the same thing for you. You go down three times, you lose automatically. You've got to win to get the money. If you draw, you get nothing. You lose, you get the experience. Shake hands, three rounds. <laughs> Round one. I was a ring fighter pretty much all my life. I turned professional at 26. It was a short career. Break, break, no hold break, break, break. I just never had backing that was sufficient enough to go further than what I did. I got much more of an exciting career out of tent boxing than I ever did as a professional fighter. I've signed more autographs and you can be like a superstar. James Ellis is probably one of the greatest boxers in Australia in his weight. I actually used to train him as a professional. He's not a real heavy-handed fella. He doesn't knock people out, but he's got every punch in the kit. He's got light and fast hands for a big bloke. I hate to lose, you know. That's not an option for me. I've had enough losses as a ring fighter. I don't want to lose as a tent fighter, too. Fred assigns a judging to experts in the crowd. After three one-minute rounds, the winner is declared. Good fight. Good fight, ladies and gentlemen. There's a the winner there. Put your hands together. 
that was a hard fight, that was very extremely hard. But uh, body punches come through and I got him playing worked. Fred invites all sorts of characters into his boxing troop. There's ex-champions, ex-jailbirds, drifters, working men, and then, well, there's this bloke. My name's Ryan Phillipson. I fight as the last Mohican. I'm 26 years old. The reason I box, I spend three minutes in the ring, someone trying to knock my head off so I can get laid all night. Oh, well, he's a sex machine. Oh, he never fails. He never fails. And, um, like, that'll be lining up and everything. Mo Egan, he fits into the trip good because I always like to have good showman with me. And he's a showman. He's like, he's, I suppose you could say he's a show pony. If he wasn't in my boxing tent and walked into this town with that hair, there'd be that many people in this town that want to fight him for a start. So that's good for me too. And because all the Sheilas love him, see? And if all the Sheilas love him, all their boyfriends hate him, and their boyfriends want to fight him to prove something to the Sheilas. It works in beautiful. <laughs> Eileen McCullens hasn't done too much experience. I'm confident. Undefeated is the way I want to stay. That's the plan. Make sure I don't lose. Want a good, clean fight. No below the belt. I always tell my boys, you get out there, you respect them, you fight them the same way as they fight you. Whatever you do, don't hurt them. But if they hurt you, hurt them back. The balance between trying to win as quickly as you can and trying to put on a show, that is definitely the hardest part. When I'm fighting, my restraint is 100%. You have to have it there. We've got to tone it down, don't hit him so hard, don't drop him. You make him look a lot better than he is. I've got to be confident. I've got to be a leader. When you know that this punch the guy's throwing at you is not going to land, for you to talk yourself into putting yourself in the way of it, that's not easy to do. Now they're the dangerous ones because they're not skilled. When you've got someone who's throwing punches from down around his waist, coming from stupid angles, it might be a stupid little punch that's got no technique whatsoever, but if it lands, it's good night, Irene. Tent boxing took off in Australia in the 1920s when several boxing troops toured the outback. By the 1970s, three generations of Fred's family had owned a boxing tent. In those days, the boxing tent was Selby Moore's. That was my uncle, yeah. Boy, uh, when I was only a young kid, all I ever wanted to do was to own a boxing tent and run one myself. When I was growing up, it was pretty tough. And uh, I mean, I can remember as a kid that my stepfather of an argument with someone and someone put an axe in his head. And we seen that as kids, you know, and, and I got mixed up with the wrong crowd at one stage there and uh, got into trouble with the law. Had a few street fights and that. And I ended up getting charged with a uh, grievous bodily harm. And I got three years over it. And I said to myself, I'll never, ever do anything like that again. I'll go back to jail. After a few years running a small sideshow circus, Fred finally got his break when his cousin, Alan Moore, decided to give the tent boxing game away. I was 24 when I started, and of course I met my uh, beautiful wife, Sandy, and I think that's what kept me together because she stuck by me all the time. 
was funny. People used to say when I met Fred that I'd run off and join the circus. But it's a good circus, it's a fun circus, and it's been a, a lucky life for me. In 1999, Fred and Sandy bought the Krakow pub, where his priceless boxing memorabilia now decorates the walls. What happened when I got the boxing tent, and those sort of people have gone through a lot of, like, hard knocks themselves, and I knew how it was because I've been there and I've done that. So they respect me, and I could understand their upbringings, and so I turned a lot of them around. An ex member of the combination comes from Munderberg and he trains on Forex, this bloke. But don't worry about his condition, ladies and gentlemen. No. There he is there. Butterbean! Get him around there. Butterbean. He's got a great personality, Butterbean. He's a tough man. I like it. Butterbean is one of our sly ones. You just wouldn't think that he was going to be a great boxer, but. Yeah, you wouldn't want to cross him in the, you know, in the ring or out of the ring, would you? But he hasn't got a, a bad bone in his body. He would help anyone out, anyone that wanted anything. He'd be the first blade to give it to you. Yeah, see, I've never done any normal boxing, but um, I learned from the streets. Where I come from, there's a lot of fights. I don't ever prepare myself for fights. The Fred's always saying to me, but I mean, stop drinking, you got to fight. And I'm like, it's the only way I can fight, Fred. <laughs> I've done it all my life, drinking and fighting, so that's my style. If I start changing now, I think I'll get beaten. There's no one fights like Butterbean, because he's got this unorthodox way of fighting, and the crowd love it. That's what I think Fred loves about me the most, and I've got no style. I throw haymakers, wild punches, but can face that way or the other way, and that sort of gets them more confused. He's a problem solver. If I get a bloke out of the crowd that I don't know if he can fight or he can't fight, or he's a street brawler, I just give him butter beef. After about one round of butterbean, they don't know where they are. <laughs> 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 Lead with it. Lead with your right. Fred often signs up new recruits to compensate for boxers that retire. His latest acquisition is a bit more unlikely than most. My name's Tamara Ran. I'm 27 years old and I'm known in the boxing tent as the Cracko Jawbreaker. I grew up in the Northern Territory. You got it. Here we go. Focus. My heritage is Dutch Indonesian, but I do have a bit of Aboriginal in me. Tamara's come onto the block and she's had a lot of trouble growing up. People picking on her, and there's not much of her, she's only a little girl. I said, OK, well, we'll take her under the wing and, that, and, and start showing a few things. Righto, jump in there. There you go, Princess. When I was in primary school and the first year of high school, the Aboriginal girls would always be like, black girl trying to be a white girl. I got in so many punch-ons, and I would just cower and let them hit me. But then one day I just thought, I've had enough. And I got up and I literally knocked the biggest girl down. Smear your right foot in when you fire your... That's it. You can see that she can look after herself, she can protect herself. We've just got to show her a few more techniques, but she'll get there. So you want to be able to slip it, slip it and then count. It's pretty good to come to where she is from where she started for a start. 
This is taken eight years ago. See the resemblance? <laughs> um, yeah, this photo won me Miss 2003 Swimsuit Calendar Girl. I was Miss April. And this is when I had an accident. Come off a motorbike and, um, yeah, I was in a coma. I was on life support for 13 days and I stayed in a semi-conscious coma for two and a half months. The doctors said I would never walk or talk again, but being the pig-headed person I am, I'd roll out of bed, like, just try and walk. So they put me in the walking frame, took a few steps, a month down the track, I was walking. When she left modelling, Tamara worked as a security guard. But everything changed when she met Fred Brophy. Yeah, I was just like, well, boys can fight, so I want to fight too. Well, Tamara had to make sure that there's nothing wrong with her as far as the accident went, that she was all right to have a fight. Now she's got confidence in herself and uh, she's just fitting in, but she's just got a lot of things to learn, but she, she'll learn. Tonight is only Tamara's second fight in the tent, so it's going to be a tag team with Fred's top female fighter, the bitch. Hey, girls, hey, come here, come here. Now, listen, girls, you're going to tell you something. Listen, I'm not here to hurt anyone. I want you to put a good show on. Now, if you run out of wind, go and tag, and I'll do the same thing, OK? And after it's all finished, I'll have a drink with you. Shake hands. How do you say? Only two in, the, two in the ring at the same time. Who's first? Can't take it, mate. Can't take it, mate. At the start, I could have got a few good hits in, but I was going soft on her because she told me she'd never fought before and I was waiting for her to punch me. When the blonde girl came in, and I should have tagged out. I was just like not thinking, just focusing. I can do this, I can do this. And I forgot it was a tag team. Krakow boxing event over, the troupe can enjoy some family time. My fire would be the heart of my boxing tent, as a matter of fact. That's the heart of it. Where you cook, where you socialise. already switched. It's like, oh, what are they? Yeah, I'm going to have a drink over there and I'll come back. I suppose you could say I'm the father and Sandy's the mother. 
it's just a big, huge family. Um, and half of them haven't had a family before because they come from, you know, pretty wild places and, and hard upbringing. I think that's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. As they're switching, their feet are coming close together, so you hit them. The Ted Boxing Life suits me. You know, I never went camping much as a kid, and we pretty much go to most shows and we camp at the shows and have a fire going, you know. There's a lot of mateship there and a lot of bonding and it's a lot of fun. If Fred sucks down, you know, I think it'll devastate me. I hope he keeps on going, like, you know, at least another five or six years it'd suit me. <laughs> After camping the weekend at Krakow, the boxers head home. Joe Sweeney, aka Butterbean, returns to his farm in Bundaberg on the Queensland coast. Hey, honey, how are you? Good. How'd we go? Yeah, all good. All good? Didn't lose another fight, which is good. That's good, honey. <laughs> Yeah, James went well done. When I first met Joe, he was great. And he's got such a beautiful, kind heart. That's what attracted me. But he's got this other side to him, which obviously comes from his hard life that he had when he was a kid. And that brings the angry side, I call it. If I wasn't meeting Helen, uh, I'd be dead. Well, I reckon I would be dead from how wild I was. When Joe met Helen, she had two children from a previous marriage. Jack was only two, and BB, she was only four when I met them, so it was a little family home. Yeah, I just formed a real good relationship with them two kids. I started to feel like I wanted to live now, and you know, she showed me a different way in life, and it was beautiful. What do you got left, girls? We nearly finished Rose. Yeah, she had Rose, and then we had Ange. And we had four beautiful kids. Dad, you know, all up with 45 potatoes. 45? 45. What do you want, a dollar for everyone? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love my kids heaps. Um, I told them I was going to get a tattoo. And I come home one day and I got Rebecca, Jack, Rose and Angelina. And I just put them in front of me so I could see them every day. I really wanted to turn my future around for my kids, but I don't want them to live the way I used to live. Joe's childhood was full of tragedy and suffering. Aged 11, he suffered third degree petrol burns. Three years later, his brother was jailed for murder. And a few years on, his brother was murdered himself. Then his mother died suddenly. I was just always angry. You hate yourself, you know. I always hurt myself to cope with it. I had a lot of fights at pubs. The demons come out of me. And then I don't know what I'm doing, who's around me. In the bad old days, Joe would often turn up at Fred Brophy's tent as a challenger. He'd come and afford a couple of my blokes first. And I, and I said, mate, you've got a lot of hatred in you, man. You, 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 you just want to get it out. He said, yeah, I love fighting. I said, well, mate, I said, you're going to end up going to jail. There's no worries about that. He was mixing with the wrong people, the bikey mob and all that sort of stuff. So I gave him a job on talking with me. I said, and people will respect you, and there is another life. And he did take notice of me, and I'm proud of it too. <laughs> Fred was a big part of turning my life around. Come on! Come on! As I went through life with Fred Bafey, I started getting respect from people, and it's been really good. Can I come? Come on, girl. Come on. Well, look at oh, that. There you go. He's got that little bit of an anger streak. But there's only about that much left there, and we just take it a little bit out with a pair of tweezers each time, every time he fights. Come here, girls. 
I'm starting to learn how to control my anger. It's actually teaching me something that I never realised I had before, self-control, and no, he's doing a good job. Straight up here, yeah. Back a bit this way, back a bit. Yeah, over this way would be good. Straight over. Fred and his team are gearing up for one of the biggest events of this final tour. There are only two stops left, and next up, it's Mount Isa. For Fred, it means a 1,500-kilometre road trip deep into the heart of mining country in northwest Queensland. Mount Isa is a tough town. It always has been. And you've got, you got miners, you've got cowboys, ringers, aboriginals, tourists. So in other words, it is a great big salad bowl. Fifteen hours on the road leaves a lot of time for thinking about the future. Said, he said to me, listen, Fred, you know, we've had the boxing in for a long time. What are you going to do when you retire? Well, when the time comes, that'll be very, very sad, a sad occasion. It won't only be a sad occasion for us, but it'll be a sad occasion for all the Australian people. And it's the last one left, and uh, when it goes, that's a bit of Australia, the sadly, that's going to go. Well, we all know what's going to happen. He's not going to live forever, is he? He's got the last boxing tent in Australia or in the world for a reason, because he's really, really good at it. It's hard to take over from someone like Fred that's really good at what he does. I don't know how you do it. It's like, how does someone take over from Elvis Presley? They don't. The Mount Isa boxing tent is coupled with the biggest radio event in Australia. It draws crowds from all over the state and beyond. Well, Mount Isa, it's a great place, and I've been coming out here over 25 years. When the rodeo's in town, I have no problems whatsoever getting something to have a fight. This is the toughest town in Australia that I've ever been to. We'll show you what it's all about. And we'll give you something you've never seen before, you'll never see again, and you're going to talk about it in years to come. Mount Isa men take tent boxing seriously. Many of them train for months so as to have a shot at beating the Brophy boys. You only get one hand going up there, there'll be about 15 or 20. Who is the best fighter? Put your hand up. I want the best. You are. Come up here. I want some good fighters this week because my blokes like to fight good people. And you want to earn yourself a reputation? Yeah. You can have James Ellis. That'll be a good fight, these two. Butter Bean, you got the other fella? Give him a rally, that'll be good. Okay, who's next? Brett from Mount Isa. Give him a rally there, Brett from Mount Isa. He looks very tough, tattoos all over the neck, the piercings in the ear, you can't have stretch shoes that hard and not be a hard bastard, Jesus, have a look at him. You're going to dominate the fight, you're going to dictate the fight, OK? I've had 18 fights for Fred so far, all of which I've won. Definitely want to stay undefeated. second round. He's thrown his punch, I knew I got in trouble. He wasn't just some big bloke off the street, he was actually a trained fighter. During the fight I realised fairly early, I was overthinking stuff and then I got to settle down. You know, and I should just be reacting to his movements, I was thinking about it too much, I was a bit slower. 
but once you've started got into that state, it's too late, the battle's already lost. I was not holding back one ounce at all. I was giving it everything I had to, to stay on my feet. I couldn't breathe. Yeah, there's no training, no nothing. You know, the crowd want to see the locals get up, so we've got to get one every now and again. We entertain us, what you got to do. Right, the Mohegan's a pretty good fighter and that, but he's still got a lot to learn. He's only a young gun. He's had a few good fights and he's won. So I think it went to his head a little bit. And uh, I think that done him the world of good last night losing because they get to a stage when they're young like that that they think they can't be beaten. Well, every boxer can be beaten. I don't care if you're Lionel Rose, Muhammad Ali. There's always someone out there that can beat you. Yeah, well, it was hard losing my undefeated streak. It's always a shot at the ego, I suppose. Just my head probably wasn't right in it and I was overthinking things and just tired from the journey and the trip and all that kind of stuff. And I think it all just sort of caught up and it was just a matter of, you know, you fought better on the night. I noticed this morning he was up early, he's training. He said, Freddie said, it won't happen again. I don't really want two losses, let alone in a row. So tonight we're going to have to pick up the pace a little bit and, and you know, put on a good show, but just make sure that I win the fight. The Mohican is not the only member of the troop who's got some soul searching to do. After Krakow, I just looked into a lot of boxing and people getting hits in the head, and then I was like, you know, starting to have my doubts about whether I want to cop these punches anymore. Yeah, sure, I could cop a few punches, but there might be that one that just, see you later. <laughs> Excuse me, friend. Can I have a top two, please? Yes, yeah, sweetheart. Yes. Um, remember I had that accident? Yeah. Um, sorry. I can't both anymore. That's all right. That's all right. No, you don't. You don't it's, it's all right. That's fine. So you don't no, have to prove nothing. You've, no, that's all right, mate. It's not the end of the road, you've got plenty of the day. Yeah, but it's sad, because I really... Oh, I know, you was looking forward to it, but, yeah. you know, there's lots of things that people want to do, but you just can't do. Yeah. And you're better off just, you know, stop where everything's all right, you know, that's, that's the main thing, so... Yeah. No worries whatsoever tomorrow. Thank you. And a great decision, love. <coughs> Good on you, sweetheart. Everyone's got to stop boxing on some occasion. All my fighters have got to stop. Every one of them. And when the time comes, you know the time, and it could be early or it could be late. She just... Done a little bit early. Well, that's fine. That's, there's no disgrace in that whatsoever. She's just looking after herself, and that's what she's got to do. But she's been there, she's done that, and she's got nothing to worry about, and she's got the highest respect of everyone. Hey, Joyce, you coming here, you and this. Fred Brophy named me the Cracko Jawbreaker. Like, I'll have that for the rest of my life because everyone knows Fred Brophy. I'm going to miss boxing heaps, but... It's just like, you know, you got the memories and the good times and I'm happy because I know that I'm not going to hurt myself and hurting my family and friends at the same time. In my corner we got Butterbee. It's the troop's second night in Mount Isa. With the Mohican already having lost his bout, Butterbean is under no illusions about how hard this fight could be. Feel good? Tight? I've fought in a lot of places around Queensland and uh, me and I have been the toughest blokes to fight. They're all good fighters. 
the whole lot. They all train all year for this one event. In a ring, in a ring, in a ring. I thought, oh, hey, I'm going to have a bit of a challenger. There's a bit of a dirty fighter. You can see it, didn't he? A good, clean, fair go fight. Shake hands. <laughs> Round one. If I get a bloke in there that wants to fight dirty, I'll just switch off that I'm not in a tent no more. I'm in a real fight. And that's where I've got to be careful. Stop the fight straight away. I told the bloke, that's it, you know, you're not allowed to do that. We don't do them sort of things here. And if you're going to fight dirty, I'll disqualify. It's as simple as that. How you going, all right? And that's exactly what I've done. I disqualified him, deliberately headbutting him. And that was the first round. He just attacked me, he just headbutted me. He split my eyebrow pretty bad, blood going everywhere. Put your hands together for Butterbean, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the years I'm afraid, with blokes like that, I'm starting to learn how to control my anger. Oh, that's what they do. They get under you, and they headbutt you, split you. It's the last night of the Mount Isa boxing event. After suffering his first defeat last night, the Mohican can't afford to lose again. He's a man on a mission. Today I didn't really do too much training, but it was more just a mental thing I had to sort out as the main priority to get my head right. Definitely going to make sure I win this fight. Right, everyone, right, a good, clean fight. Don't hit anyone below the belt or behind the back of the neck. That's one of my rituals, eyeing up the opponent. If he's half intimidated before I start the fight, then I've already won half the battle. Shake hands, free, free round. Round one. What actually gets me angry is not the fact that he's hit me, it's the fact that the crowd started to cheer for him. serious mode, I can feel the tension building up and now I can just release it. Your instincts are better, you're a lot sharper, you're hitting harder, you're hitting quicker, you're thinking a lot clearer. shaky on the first round there, got a few punches, but nothing else going to hurt me. But at the end of the day, it's yeah. the great, great to be winning again. It feels really good. So far, I've um, had a couple nights in a row where I haven't been home alone. Actually, so far, I haven't slept in my own swag, so that's not a bad thing. This tent boxing is perfect for my lifestyle. I love to box. I love being around my good mates. 
you know, I just love it all. And for this to stop, that, yeah, that'd be a shattering for me. All of us feel the same way. All of us boxers don't want Fred to retire. Fred won't let us fight and get injured, and I got injured from my headbutt, as everyone knows. And, um, we do get looked after that way. As much as I want to fight, he won't let me. Yeah, well, I'm disappointed, and so has Butterbean. But that's how it goes. And I said, well, Butterbean, if we let you fight tonight, if someone cuts it, it's going to be worse. It means you can't fight at Birdsville. And that's, and that's when I really will need you. Well, I may need, need him here. So we just have to, uh, James Ellis will have to fight too. It's the final session at the Mount Isa Rodeo and James Ellis's big night. With Butterbean on the bench, James has already had to fight twice tonight. And he's won both bouts. Put your hands together for the bay from there's a winner there. But to see if he's got what it takes to step up as the troop's number one boxer, Fred sets James a new challenge. James Ellis is going to fight two, and it's going to be a tag team. There's two against one. That's not a bad effort. Put your hands together for James Ellis. Quite tight and sore. You've got niggles and pains and aches, but you've got to put up with that. Now, what's happening there? You've got to fight the two of you, but there's only one in the ring at one time. It's going to be a five or six rounder. Fred set me up to do a few of these um, more difficult fights. It's part of all the grooming, you know, it's the apprenticeship. Like I said, Cowboys, big shoes to fill. A good, clean, fair go fight. Shake hands. Good luck. Good luck, mate. Round one. Have a good game. Both blokes told Fred that they had no uh, boxing experience at all and yet when they jumped in the ring after the first 30 seconds, I, I knew they could fight. You're an individual against two fighters. Like you just get one bloke tired, and you can finish him normally, but you can't because he sends his mate out and he's fresh. Five rounds with that just happening was blowing my mind. I copped a clean punch in the solar plexus. And Yeah, that stuffed me. I thought I was gone. But you try and recover from it quickly and make it as though it was nothing. Generally, when I've been hit with a very big punch, you get a flash of pain. I still keep my eyes open, I know what's going on. You seem to lose all concentration and it's like starting all over again. In a tough fight, all that's going through my mind pretty much is surviving and trying to see what he's doing. When I'm in that zone and you're struggling and you know, you've got big punches coming at you. Sometimes you just, they just zoom by. You just, for some reason, you feel where they are. You don't think about them, you don't see them. You know, it gives you a shiver sometimes. You're like, how did I do that? It's freakish. Out 
Yeah, he's the winner. No, 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 no. no. Uh, two on one, come on. Two on one. We cheated. Two on one. You sure? Yeah, he's tough uh, motherfucker. That's the winner. Thank you. Hard work that was. I didn't win, but I didn't lose either. I reckon it was a draw. And it took a lot of honour and everything to say that I won. So, yeah. I take my head off to James. He's the star, and believe you and me, he's a star like like uh, the cowboy was, and he's just going to get better. Yeah, great fight, James. Nice love you, mate. Love yeah, you. I've got a lot of respect for them boys too. Cool. I got an education tonight. There's not not one time you don't learn in a fight, and I learned a lot from that one. I'd like to have a whole set of shows where I look as good as the cowboy, you know, still stay undefeated. And, become the champion I want to be. With Mount Isa over and Birdsville being the last remaining stop on the tour, thoughts of retirement, why on Fred's mind? It's, it's hard to explain, but um, like years ago, this is where I sort of made my name out here in Virgil. And um, like this is really, really my home out here, I suppose. I guess he probably feels that it will be a big part of uh, the Australian culture and history if he does close down the boxing tent and he stops doing it, and I think that has a big weight on his shoulders. Well, I reckon my last stand will be at Birdville. That'll be very, very sad, a sad occasion. I guess about all I can say. Final episode of Outback Fight Club. The bitch is back with a score to settle. And when it's someone else's fault that we lost, then that makes me angry. He's had 1,000 fights in the last fight. And the cowboy, well, he needs to make it count. It's real important I remain undefeated. And I'd hate to go out on a bad note. Will Butterbean keep his cool? What you've done there before is no good. And is this the end of the road for Fred's troop? There's a bit of a rumour uh, getting around Australia and that that I'm going to retire. Well, I'm going to tell you something.